The USA and Europe are similar in size, population, standard of living, and lifestyle. But as an American myself, after spending more than one year of my life in Europe and visiting every single country on the continent, there are some major cultural differences that need to be addressed. Bonjour! Disclaimer, I know it's impossible to group Europe into one category. So these are general realizations that may not exist in every European country. Here are 18 cultural differences that Europe has over the USA. Second bourgeois in Paris. One, pay to use public toilets. It's not free to pee or do your business in public. You have to pay usually one euro to use the bathroom, even if it's just to wash your hands. Two, water is not free. When you order water in a restaurant, it usually comes in a tiny glass bottle and costs two to five euros. They love sparkling water too, so make sure to tell them you want still water. Can I get a still water please? Travel tip, carry around an empty water bottle and fill it up in sinks or public fountains. It's all purified. Three, every city has history. In America, we don't have much to talk about before the 17th century. In Europe, some castles are 500 years older than the US even became a country. Four, they drive less. Public transportation is everywhere and efficient in Europe, and most cities are pedestrian and bike friendly. There's really no need for a car, and gas is too expensive anyways. Five, sports are not a family affair. In the States, we pregame and drink beers and tailgate for sports games with our families and friends. In Europe, sports aren't such big events, except for soccer, which they love. Six, smaller food portions. This is the size of a normal meal in Europe, and this is a standard Coke. Also, ketchup is not free and comes in glass bottles. Seriously? Seven, cigarettes are fashionable. They aren't so looked down upon among Europeans either. I guess they don't have the dare program in Europe. In other words, smoking equals cool. Eight, they dress nicer. They don't just throw on basketball shorts, a university t-shirt, and sandals. Sup, dude? They always dress to impress. <laughs> and about those haircuts. Nine, they can speak multiple languages. It's not uncommon to meet Europeans who speak four, five, or six languages fluently. This beer is very good. This beer is all good. To pivo je výborný. Je to pivo očem vkusné. To pivo je velmi dobré. Ten. They recycle more. Metal cans, plastic, paper, bottles. Europeans recycle more and take better care of their environment. In Germany, the government incentivizes you with 25 cents for returning an empty bottle. Empty water bottles can make you rich in Germany. Many Americans seem to throw trash on the streets without thinking about the consequences. 11. Coins actually matter. Don't lose your euros. This handful of coins is 20 euros or 24 US dollars. If these were quarters, it'd be about three dollars. See the difference? 12. Toilets have two buttons. This makes a lot more sense, right? Big ones for poop, small ones for pee, to save a lot of water every flush. Also, bathroom sinks are tiny. Check for little kids. <laughs> 13. Electric cars. It's more and more common to drive small electric cars in Europe. Once again, better for the environment. And you can pull into these parking spaces and you charge it. It's so simple. 14. Fewer trash cans. I never had this problem back home, but in Europe, it always seems like there's a trash can every two miles. But believe it or not, the streets are clean. 15. Street signs are tricky. Can't find the street sign? Look on the building. It's usually there. 16. Dinner is an all-night activity. Expect to spend three or more hours schmoozing and eating with your friends at the dinner table. In the US, if we wait more than five minutes to get our check, we talk to the manager. Don't be in a hurry if you're going to dinner with Europeans. 17. They love the outdoors. You'll notice this by seeing tons of parks and outdoor cafes phase all over Europe. They love their leisure time and they don't use their phones as much as we do. 18. Longer vacation. Many European countries like France have six or more weeks of vacation or holiday as I call it. In the US, two weeks would be generous. Four years ago, I spent three months traveling northern India. My favorite states were Rajasthan, Punjab and Uttar Pradesh and I thought all of India was like that. But three weeks ago, I returned to a completely new India. This time, we road trip South India, from Kochi to Madurai to Pondicherry to Chennai. I'm still trying to gather my thoughts on how different the North is from the South. It is early morning here in Kolon. We're at the market and everybody's setting up their shop and everyone's so friendly, it's amazing. But overall, I love them both for different reasons. Let's find out how they're different. I find the southern states to be safer, more orderly, and more relaxed, whereas the north has more chaotic streets. 
with so many honking horns and cows blocking the road. The south is extremely green and tropical, almost like I never left Thailand. The north feels more like storybook India with the most beautiful landscapes of desert and mountains. It's like you traveled back in time. The people and culture from north to south could not be any different. Thank you. North Indians are generally taller and whiter, whereas southerners are shorter and darker. While every region in India has their own dialect. I'm here in India and thankfully my friend was able to give me a feature in the newspaper. Unfortunately, I can't read it because it's all in the local language. The most common language of Hindi is spoken almost exclusively in the north. In terms of cuisine, South Indian food is spicier and uses more coconuts and rice. North Indian food is usually the one that you've eaten abroad, butter chicken and thick curries with naan. But if there's one thing found all over India, it's delicious chai, which I drink every morning. The best way to think about India is like Europe. When you move from one Indian state to the next, it's like hopping European countries. The language changes, the religion changes, the food, the people, the culture, and so on. I love both North and South India equally, and I hope now you can understand their differences. What's up everyone, Drew Binsky here. In continuation of my country comparison series, today I present you with Korea, the North versus South. I'm sure many of you guys, like myself, are specifically interested in this episode because you've heard how opposite the two countries are. You've heard about the DMZ or Demilitarized Zone, the most heavily guarded border in the world. You've heard about Kim Jong-un, who is rumored to be dead as I speak this, and you likely know a thing or two about South Korean pop culture. Open Gangnam Style. But what is life really like in North and South Korea, apart from what the media tells us? Are they really as opposite as we think? After spending over two years living in South Korea, not only did I become conversational in the Korean language, but I also learned a lot about its culture and history. This inspired me to take a fascinating trip to Pyongyang, North Korea a few years ago <laughs> right before Americans became banned to visit. In this video, I'm gonna share with you my thoughts about the two nations and we begin with the similarities. The Korean Peninsula is located west of Japan and just below the southeastern tip of Russia. That means freezing cold winters and mild summers. Both countries, which are about the same size and area, are very green, mountainous, and densely populated. Since the beginning of humanity up until 1953, Korea was one country with one language, one race, and one cuisine. That's why today they still share the same common last names such as Kim, Lee, and Park because they come from the same family dynasties. Despite being separated for the last 67 years, the Korean language roots are virtually the same across the border. Only one has evolved and one hasn't. It's kind of like Old British English versus American English. When looking at the physical features of the people, the faces in the north are hardly different from the south unless you consider plastic surgery, which South Korea is the world leader. And when it comes to food, both are kimchi loving spicy food eaters where you can find similar menu items. Both North and South Koreans have a deep love and respect for their elders. They bow to show appreciation, use a more polite dialect, and use two hands when giving or receiving something. When it comes to holidays, all 76 million Koreans living in the North and the South celebrate the same Korean New Year's and Korean Thanksgiving Day called Chuseok. And lastly, both are excellent at ping pong, badminton, and taekwondo, and in general, they love to have fun. Yes, even in North Korea, you can see people singing and dancing with family and friends and enjoying life. Okay, now we're gonna move onwards to the key differences. South Korea is a very capitalistic, first world society run by President Moon Jae-in, whereas its northern neighbors are living in a communist hermit kingdom. The dictator of North Korea is Kim Jong-un and the locals look up to him as a god, or at least they are pressured to think that way. The previous two dictators were his father, Kim Jong-il, and grandfather, Kim Il-sung, who are standing strong in this monument. The economies of the two nations are polar opposites. South Korea is the world's 12th biggest economy, home to massive brands like Samsung, LG, and Kia. In North Korea, well, let's just say they don't produce much as their GDP per capita ranks 179th. 
South Korea actually feels very Americanized with their consumer-driven society, well-liked pop culture idols, and they even use English words to replace Korean words such as shopping, computer, and makeup. In the North, you won't find any internationally recognized brands or even street signs. It's the only country in the world where I haven't seen Coca-Cola, and the streets overall feel very dark and gloomy and depressing. In South Korea, it's quite the opposite. It feels bright and happy on every corner. Both Koreas have different education and military systems. The military duty in the South, which is mandatory for all males, is only 21 months long, but in North Korea, it's 10 years long. This means that the dating culture in the North is much older because men are spending their entire 20s in uniform. Fashion trends on both sides of the border are totally different. On the streets of Pyongyang, you'll see people wearing solid colors, mostly black and white, and the government actually bans skinny jeans, miniskirts, and certain hairstyles. But in Seoul, you'll notice that South Koreans have the freedom to wear whatever they want, heavily inspired by K-pop idols and Western trends. It seems as if the rest of Asia is always trying to catch up with South Korea in terms of fashion. The final big difference between the two nations is the internet. North Korea is the world's most isolated country because they don't really have internet, at least not for anyone who isn't elite. As a result, they are not influenced by ideas or trends happening outside of its borders. When I was there, I asked several people if they've ever heard of Facebook and not a single person said yes. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the South Koreans who live in the most connected country in the world in terms of Wi-Fi availability with the fastest speeds. And in all honesty, they are obsessed with the internet. No matter where you go, you'll see them glued to their phone screens 24 seven. It's absolutely bizarre. So as you guys can see, I absolutely love talking about North and South Korea because I spent so much time living and traveling on the peninsula. It's one of my favorite places in the whole world and I really hope to go back there soon whenever it is possible again. I realized that I don't have many videos from South America and that's because I did all my travels there in 2016 before I owned a video camera. Copacabana Beach is the main beach here in Rio. That being said, later this year I am heading to Ecuador and Venezuela, two of my final six countries, so you can expect to see a lot of amazing stories down on the continent. In today's video, we're gonna compare and contrast the two rival nations of Argentina and Brazil. And when I say rival nations, this is mostly what I'm referring to. But in reality, Argentina and Brazil are both incredible places. I spent over a month traveling between the two nations and I'm just itching to get back. So with that being said, let's jump right into it with the similarities. Both Argentina and Brazil are the two largest countries in South America and share a similar historical origin. The two nations were colonized by European powers and became independent six years apart in the early 19th century. Both nations are packed with natural resources, are among the top 25 largest economies in the world, and have a similar GDP per capita. When it comes to people, Argentinians and Brazilians are some of the kindest around and they are very proud of their countries. I've never met more passionate people, and it shows in their love of football and sports. I suit you, babe. Also, the majority of people follow Catholicism. Alright guys, let's move on now to the key differences. Brazil is three times larger in area, five times bigger in population, and has an economy that's four times bigger than Argentina. While both countries have dozens of indigenous languages, the main one in Brazil is Portuguese, while in Argentina, it's Spanish. That leads us to the obvious colonization in both nations, but they were done quite differently. Spanish colonization in Argentina was mainly driven by enslaving indigenous people, whereas in Brazil, the Portuguese brought slaves in from Africa. As a result, most Argentinians today are descendants from Europeans or lighter skinned, while in Brazil, it's heavily mixed with African heritage or dark skinned being the majority. When it comes to nature, Argentina has Patagonia, which means great hiking and skiing. Brazil is more in the tropics and 60% of its land is located in the Amazon. In terms of food, Brazil wins in acai. Ladies and gentlemen, for lunch we have a giant bowl of fresh acai. As well as powdered queijo or cheesy bread and feijoada, which is a black bean and pork stew. In Argentina, it's all about the meat. You can expect to find lots of excellent steak, pork, chicken, ribs, sausages, and more. 
Do not forget to dip your meat in my favorite sauce in the world called chimichurri. Also, I found the empanadas and wine in Argentina to be the best on the continent. In terms of culture, I found the people in Brazil to be a bit more laid back and they were hardly ever on time. But that being said, I was offered into countless people's homes and they were just so kind. In Argentina, the society functions a lot more orderly and efficient, kind of like in Europe. The best way to meet locals there is by drinking mate or a tea-like beverage with herbs and warm water. They also drink the same stuff halfway across the world in Syria. The USA and Canada are two of the most similar countries in the world and they've always remained close friends, but they might be a little more different than you'd expect. In this video, I'm gonna compare and contrast the USA versus Canada. Quick disclaimer guys, I am American and I spent the first 21 years of my life in the US before I started traveling abroad. I've also been to Canada five times and I really love it there. I am making this video from an unbiased point of view and I'm trying to make it as educational as possible. So with that being said, let's jump right in with the similarities. Both the USA and Canada are in North America and are predominantly English speaking. Both countries are huge in size. Canada is the world's second largest and the US is the third. With enormous size comes lots of national parks and stunning natural beauty. In terms of the overall life on the streets and standard of living, they are pretty much the exact same. The strip malls, the fast food joints, the retail shops, there's almost no way to tell the difference unless you see one of these. Both the US and Canada have a tipping culture in restaurants where 15 to 20% is expected. So not surprisingly, you will find excellent customer service. And lastly, both nations are obsessed with sports, both are very patriotic, and the religion is predominantly Christian. Okay, that wraps up the key similarities. Now we can move onwards to the fun part, the differences. Despite being smaller in size, the US has a much bigger population, the third highest in the world with 329 million residents. On the other hand, Canada is the world's 39th most populous nation with 37 million people, roughly the same size as California. Canada is freezing and during the winter time, it pretty much snows everywhere. The US does have some cold states, but many are set in warmer climates like right now where I am in Arizona. About 20% of Canadians are native French speakers, while 15% of Americans are native Spanish speakers. Canadians are nicer people overall, and it's not only my opinion. Just about every friendliest country ranking I found online has Canada listed in the top 10. Canadians also have slightly different accents and different lingo than Americans. A. They also spell certain words differently than us, like color, O-U-R, and center, R-E. In the world of sports, both countries like football, basketball, baseball, golf, soccer, and lacrosse, but in Canada, nothing is bigger than hockey. They are the proud inventors of the sport and is followed in every corner of the country. When it comes to food, Canada wins on poutine, bacon, and maple syrup, while the US wins in pizza, barbecue, burgers, and apple pie. Okay, maybe that one is slightly opinionated, but it's honestly the truth. While both currencies are called the dollar, they're actually quite different, and only here in the States you can find useless pennies. Does anybody use pennies anymore these days? In terms of political systems, the US and Canada both have democracies, but they function differently. The USA is led by a president, and we have two major parties, Democratic and Republican. In Canada, they are led by a prime minister, and they have four major parties and several smaller ones. Lastly, another big difference is that Canadians get free healthcare for everyone, and going to university is a lot cheaper than here in the US. Turkmenistan. I visited this Central Asian country just two months ago, and it was a very strange experience, to say the least. And then you have North Korea. I went to the Hermit Kingdom a little over two years ago, and to my knowledge, I'm one of the last few Americans to visit after the travel ban took place. In today's video, I want to share with you how I find Turkmenistan and North Korea to be shockingly similar, and we start by getting inside. 
Both countries require a private or group tour to get the visa, and the trip overall is very expensive, something like $200 to $400 per day. At all times, from morning to night, you must be with your tour guide without any exceptions. This is the Arch of Triumph. It's a place we are present in Mr. Mehdi's triumphant speech. Both countries are among the most repressive in the world, and they are extremely corrupt. They both lack basic rights, freedom of speech, and they have a flawed criminal justice system which commonly sees torture and abuse among its citizens. Both Pyongyang and Ashgabat, the two capital cities, are newly constructed since the 1950s. Both are very clean, organized, and stunning to look at from the outside with tall buildings, decorated plazas, and monuments. But it's all fake. The streets are completely dead and it gives you the eeriest feeling to walk around. The only people around here are construction workers uh, and soldiers. The next similarity is their strong sense of nationalism. In either country, photos of their dictator can be seen everywhere, just like their country's flag, colors, and traditions. Few places on earth have national pride more than Turkmenistan and North Korea. I'm like freaking out right now. The main difference between the two nations is that the people of Turkmenistan don't seem distressed. They do smile and they are super hospitable. So I just met these awesome young girls in the park and they're really friendly. Hello! Hi. Hi! Whereas North Koreans look unhappy across the board. Another difference is that Turkmenistan's hotels are equipped with Wi-Fi. Despite being heavily censored, it's still possible to access the internet. On the flip side, if you visit North Korea as a tourist, don't expect any connection to the outside world. So we're about to take the Pyongyang Metro. And lastly, Turkmenistan does have a relationship with the West, specifically the USA. There is an American embassy in Ashgabat, and the two countries remain friendly with one another. Obviously, this is not the case with North Korea. So to wrap it all up, no two countries in the world are stranger than Turkmenistan and North Korea, and they have some massive humanitarian issues. The Philippines and Indonesia are both countries that I adore and have spent a lot of time in over the past few years. But I realize they often get mixed up as they are both exotic island nations and the two most populous countries in Southeast Asia. Both are filled with stunning beaches, volcanoes, green landscape, and smiling faces, which their looks are shockingly similar. The cost of living in both is more or less the same and the island life could not be more prevalent. But culturally speaking, the two countries don't exactly feel the same. Of course, there's the obvious things like jeepneys in the Philippines, street musicians in Indonesia, and the diversity in cuisine. But let's look a little closer so we can fully understand their cultural differences. 1. Colonization The Philippines was colonized longest by the Spanish, while for Indonesia it was the Dutch. This instilled new values, beliefs, and traditions into each country, leading them to what they are today. That's why the Indonesian language has over 10,000 Dutch-rooted words, and it's also why Filipinos eat foods like lechon, adobo, and leche flan. 2. Religion Behind me is the Istiklal Mosque. This is the third biggest mosque in the world. It holds 200,000 people. Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim country with 264 million people. This means that it's hard to find pork and you will hear prayers out loud five times a day. But as a whole, they aren't as religious as Filipinos who are over 90% Catholic. Nobody celebrates any holiday as festive as Filipinos celebrate CHRISTMAS! Three, language. Indonesia has over 300 native languages, while the Philippines has 170. Most of them being regional dialects. <laughs> while both countries are easy to get around with English, Filipinos take the crown with their fluency in the language. So the next time you hear someone say that the Philippines and Indonesia are the same, remember what we have learned about in this video. I recommend coming to both as they have so many hidden gems to offer. After spending the last 72 hours going all over Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, I couldn't help but compare it to my current home of Bangkok. The two capital cities are just a quick two-hour flight away from each other. Thank you. Thank you. 
which is very affordable and convenient on Air Asia. But which city is better? Which one is worse? It's time to find out. Disclaimer, this video is nothing more than my observations as I experience each city. If you disagree with me about something, then I encourage you to challenge my perspectives. Let's begin with the similarities between KL and Bangkok. They both are capital cities in Southeast Asia. They are both business hubs with massive skyscrapers. The prices are more or less the same. Thank you. Shopping malls are found everywhere. The heat and pollution are about equal, and the public transportation systems are both as efficient. As for the differences, I'll break it down into these five categories. Food, things to do, lifestyle, people, and nightlife. Food. While both cities are food paradises, I'm going to have to give the edge to Kuala Lumpur just for the diversity, especially in the hawker centers. The variety and quality of food here is outstanding. Malay, Indian, Chinese, and Middle Eastern flavors are all mixed together on each plate. Things to do. I find there to be more things to do in Bangkok than KL. The Grand Palace, night markets, river cruise, and just walking around the city, which is not so easy to do in KL. After three days of exploring Malaysia's capital, I sort of felt like I ran out of things to do, whereas in Bangkok, I'm still discovering things after three months. However, Bangkok has nothing as stunning as the Twin Towers. Lifestyle. KL is a lot cleaner, less congested, and more organized. Nobody's honking the horn, there's no tuk-tuks driving through. Which leads to a more laid-back life. There aren't as many street vendors blocking the sidewalks. If this was Bangkok, this entire corner would be filled with street vendors. KL also has better infrastructure, better roads, and a better concentrated skyline. Whereas Bangkok is sort of sprawling everywhere, with miserable traffic of tuk-tuks, motorbikes, buses, taxis, cars, and bikes. Bicycles. Nightlife. No brainer on this one. Bangkok wins hands down. Bangkok has many different nightlife districts. This is Cal San Road! With concentrated bars and clubs, where KL has everything spread out and not as many options. People. It's challenging and almost not fair to pick favorites in this category because I get along with almost everyone, but simply for the fact that most Malaysians can speak English so well. For me, I'm Karazan. I was able to make friends much easier and get to know them better. What? People in KL are very multicultural and they have more national pride. I've never in my life seen more national flags than I've seen in Malaysia. In Thailand, there is a huge language barrier. All things considered, I really can't pick a favorite city. Both are amazing for different reasons and I encourage you to visit them on your next trip to Southeast Asia. Right behind this green fence is India and we just saw an amazing ceremony. What do you think, man? It's amazing, it's incredible. It's so cool! If I do my foot here, like I'm in India. She's in India right now. And now my toes are in India. I've spent about four months of my life in India, and after just one week in Pakistan, I can't help but notice how similar they are. They're kind of like brothers. Let's take a moment to look past the current political situation and let's stop pointing our fingers because I strongly feel that peace will prevail among these nations. I thought today would be fitting to make this video because I'm in Lahore, the bustling center of Pakistani Punjab sharing a border with Indian Punjab. Yes, they're both called Punjab. This is not a coincidence. Right now I'm at the Wagga border ceremony and it's amazing. Exactly four years ago, I was watching the same ceremony on the other side of the border, sitting in that seat. The fact is, when comparing India to Pakistan, I see a lot more similarities than differences. Let's talk about the differences first, which mostly revolve around religion. India is 80% Hindu, while Pakistan is 97% Muslim. This means that in India, you'll see colorful Hindu temples and they don't eat cows, while in Pakistan, you'll hear prayers on the loudspeakers five times a day and you won't find any liquor stores. India, however, is much more diverse in terms of religion, with big communities of Muslim, Sikh, and Christians. Then you have the obvious differences like size and population. India is is four times larger by area and has six times as many people, making it more densely populated. In terms of cuisine, Indians eat a lot of vegetarian food, whereas meat is found everywhere in Pakistan, except pork. Now let's discuss the similarities. Okay, so this was the Delhi gate. People coming from Delhi entered Lahore from this. This is called the Royal Trade. Both Pakistan and India are in South Asia and share over 3,200 kilometers of border. Both are obsessed with cricket, 
and equally enjoy eating biryani and drinking chai throughout the day. The people have more or less the same skin color. Men love beards, women love colors. The streets of Pakistan feel eerily similar to those of North India. The markets, the traffic, the architecture, the people. However, South India is like a different world. Both nations are former British colonies, which means that people can equally speak English well. I'm from Kira, Pakistan. It's a part of Punjab, about 150 kilometers northwest of Lahore. The independence movements of both Pakistan and India were conducted right here in Lahore in August 1947. For communication, Pakistan's main language is called Urdu, which is almost identical to India's Hindi. They sound the same to my ears, except the scripts are totally opposite. When it comes to hospitality, oh man, the people are what makes these two countries so amazing. Both India and Pakistan have extremely warm, generous, and humble people. If we should talk about nature, both countries share the tallest mountain range in the world. Both have beautiful coastlines, amazing deserts, deep valleys, luscious lakes, and peaceful rivers. So from my observations, Pakistan and India are brothers, and I hope we can all take a second to appreciate this. What's up guys, as it's the last day of this amazing Hurtigruten trip around Greenland and Iceland, I thought I'd do a little video comparing and contrasting the two places. Let's begin with the similarities because pretty much everything is different. Both are beautiful islands located in the Arctic with cold weather, stunning nature, and a wide variety of animals. That's about it for the similarities. The biggest difference is that their names should be flipped because Greenland is covered in ice and Iceland is covered in greenery. When it comes to size, Iceland is tiny, just smaller than the state of Kentucky. On the other hand, Greenland is massive, about eight times larger than Texas. Politically speaking, Iceland is a sovereign country, while Greenland is technically part of Denmark. This means that Iceland has its own government system, its own currency, and voting power in the UN, whereas Greenland has to rely on Denmark for all of the above. The people of Iceland are descendants from the Vikings, tall, white, blonde hair, and blue eyes. The natives of Greenland are called Inuits, who share the same ethnic roots as the Arctic settlers of Alaska, Canada, and Siberia. With such opposite people, the languages, cuisines, and traditions of Iceland and Greenland are completely different. Sugar, sugar Disneyland. Iceland is easily accessible as a tourist destination and over 2 million people come here every year. We are in the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's just like this natural spa. It practically saved us from um, the bank crisis and it's good for us. It brings more variety. It brings more life, especially for these small towns. Um, it becomes way more bearable to live here. On the contrary, Greenland gets around 70,000 visitors a year. You can actually hear the silence here. It is just complete blissful nature and does not have the infrastructure for tourism. The ground feels like a giant sponge. Crazy. Both Greenland and Iceland are amazing places and this has been a wonderful trip to say the least.